and welcome to each one of you. We're glad that you're back to take a look at the end of the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation in this series that we're doing on the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we have just chapter by chapter gone through the book of Revelation. And we will continue going through the book of Revelation. But it tells us a lot of wonderful things that God has in store for you and for me. And also, if you're watching by television, we thank you for joining us. We pray that uh, what you're learning will be a help to you, or if you're listening by radio. And in this day and age, you can be sitting at your computer and watching it by the Internet. So we just, whatever method by which you're uh, watching the program, we're welcoming you and glad that you uh, have tuned in and all. As I mentioned, we're down to the last part of the 14th chapter, and our subject today is entitled The Second Coming of Christ, because the uh, end of the 14th chapter talks about Jesus coming back, and that's what we'll be looking at. Uh, after this, we move into a subject that uh, carries a lot of, uh, how should I say, not very pleasant things, and that is the seven last plagues. Seven last plagues that will be poured out at the end of time. I want to just say to you, before even we get into this next subject on the seven last plagues, Remember, the seven last plagues do not fall on the righteous. You understand that? Seven last plagues do not fall on the righteous. Psalms 91 makes it very clear. It says, no plague shall come nigh your dwelling. So uh, that the righteous aren't going to receive any of the seven last plagues, but you will observe them. And I'm sure a lot of things will be happening all around, but you need to understand what they are, and that's what we'll be looking at in our next presentation. But today, we're talking about the coming of Jesus Christ, an event that we look forward to. When Christ is going to come back, uh, set up his kingdom, and he has certain things that he's looking for, certain things that he's waiting on, folks. And that's what we're going to look at here in this presentation, some of the things that he's waiting on and, and all uh, before he comes back. So uh, get out your Bible, uh, get you a pad and pencil, and take notes and follow as we talk about the coming of Jesus Christ. Over the years, I personally have been blessed in a special way, by the music of Donna Klein, uh, playing the organ and then also singing for us. Uh, it has just been a real, real blessing to work with her, and we thank her for giving her life to the Lord and serving him and uh, sharing her talent with each one of us. And she's going to sing a forced in this presentation, and her song is going to be Heaven's sounding sweeter all the time. Beautiful, beautiful song. But before she does, uh, Chuck Algar is going to come and he's going to read to you the scripture that deals with our subject here in this presentation. And then Donna will sing. Good afternoon. Again, if you have your Bibles, we're going to continue on in Revelation, Revelation chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles, Let's turn to Revelation chapter 14. We're going to read 14 uh, through 20, verses 14 through 20. Let's read together. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap. For the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. 
he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs. May God add his blessing to his word. Well, we have looked at three angels. Those three angels have given their message that God had given them with a loud voice. That message, Scripture makes it clear to go to all the world because in Bible prophecy, when it uses angels in this sense, it represents a message that's to be carried to the whole world. And these three angels had messages that the whole world is to hear in preparation for Jesus Christ, for his return. And they've sounded their message. They've given it. And now the next thing it says is to take place is the coming of Jesus Christ. And so we read here in Revelation, the 14th chapter and the 14th verse, it says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on that cloud, cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. So here sets one on this cloud, like the Son of Man. Actually, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, has a crown on his head, sickle in his hand. He's coming back. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that that text says that one like the Son of Man. I'm glad it didn't say some being from another planet. You know, I'm glad it says one like the Son of Man, one that I know, one that can be sympathetic with me, one that can understand the trials and the heartaches and all the things that we go through. He's been here. He's gone through it. He's experienced it. He knows what those are. And so this is one that you and I, no. You see, it's very, very important that you know him. And when I say know him, I'm, don't, I'm not talking about on a casual acquaintance. I'm talking about knowing him and knowing him in a very, very intimate way because it says very clearly that when he comes back, one of the, as far as I'm concerned, the most terrible words in all the Scripture is when he says, I don't know you. You know, we, you need to know him. And here's one like the Son of Man that was here, walked among us, cared for us, died for us, and day by day is willing to be with us and care for us and direct us and help us and comfort us and give us those things that we need to walk and live for him day by day. Does that. The same Jesus that loved the little children. The same Jesus that healed the sick. The same Jesus that came and died for you and me. He's coming back. One like the Son of Man. But it says that he has in his hand a sickle. Sickle is used for reaping. So he's coming back to reap. And this picture here in Revelation, the 14th chapter, is a picture of him coming to reap the harvest. That's what he's coming to do. So he has a sickle in his hand, and he's there to reap the harvest of the earth. And it tells us clearly that this is what has happened. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, 
speaking of Christ, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So one thing that's necessary for the coming of Christ is the harvest has to be ripe. And he says the harvest is ripe. Come, thrust in your sickle, reap, for the harvest is ripe. Okay? So who? Who is being reaped here when it talks about it? Well, it's clear that the time has come because it says, And I saw one of its heads that had been mortally wounded. His deadly wound was healed. All the world marveled and what? Followed the beast. So all those who go contrary to God are opposed to the word of God, are opposed to the Lord. These people are all following the beast, going with the beast. They're, these are all of the wicked. That They have made their decision. They have sealed their decision. Therefore, that time has come. The cup, if you please, God is so merciful, so kind, and he has waited, patiently waited, till the cup of iniquity was full. And when that cup of iniquity is full, then that is when the curtain falls and it's done. And in this case, they've done that. They've all turn, follow the beast, and doing what he says. At the same time, it says, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. Those who have victory over the beast, over the image, over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. So, here they are. There are all the righteous. They have put themselves on the side of the Lamb. They are followers of Christ, and they have victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark. They have chosen which side they're on. So both sides have made their decisions, and the time has come for him to reap the harvest. This is what is taking place. And he answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. When Jesus was here on earth, he told a parable. He told a parable about this harvest that he is going to reap. And he said that a man went out and sowed his field, and that he sowed it with good seed. And while he was asleep, the enemy came and sowed tares or weeds in the field. And when the wheat began to come up, so came up the tares. And his servants went to him and they said, Lord, when you sowed the wheat, didn't you use good grain? And he said, yes. And they said, well, there's tares in with the wheat. What do you want us to do? Go and pull them up? And he said, no. Let the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. And then we will separate the wheat from the tares. The tares will be bound into bundles and burned. Well, after Christ had told that parable to the people and all, uh, and after they had left, his disciples came to him and they said, tell us what you meant by this parable. Explain it to us. And so Jesus explained the parable to them, and this is what he said. He answered and said to them, He who sowed good seed is the Son of Man. So it's very, very clear that Christ is the one that sows the good seed seed. This is the seed. Christ is the one that sows it, and therefore you and I are to come, and we are to find what the good seed is. Okay? So, good seed. All right, let's go on. He says, 
The field is the how much? It's the world, the whole world. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. So he's clearly divided up. And as I told you, previous one, there isn't three sides, folks. We, we, mustn't, we mustn't try to make three sides. There's either the wheat and the tares. They're one or the other. That's the way the Scripture is. It does that all the way through. It talks about the sheep and the goats. It talks about the righteous and the unrighteous. It never talks about a third one. It talks about two, one side or the other. And so that's what you have here, okay? The seed, the good seed, are the righteous, sons of the kingdom. The tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. One that sowed the tares is the devil. Okay? The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Okay, so it's lined everything up. We've got the good seed. This is the righteous. The tares are the wicked. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. This is how it's divided up. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. So the Scripture makes it clear at the end, all the tares are going to be gathered and gathered into bundles, and they will be burned. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness. In other words, He said He's going to send out His angels. They're the reapers. They're going to gather all those that offend. They'll be bound into bundles and burned. That is how it will come to an end. And will cast them into, furna into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So we'll take them and cast them into the furnace, and that will be the end of them. Then the righteous, they're going to what? The righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has an ear... To hear, let him hear. This is what Christ described is to take place when he comes back and the reaping is to take place. It behooves you and me to make sure that we are what? That we are the wheat, not the tares. We've got to be the wheat. That's most important that we are. All right. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So he who sat on the cloud, Christ, who is sitting on the cloud, is going to thrust in his sickle, and the earth is going to be reaped. This is what is going to happen. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to harm the earth and the sea, who, when Christ thrust in his sickle and reaps the earth, who is he reaping? Well, if you read it carefully, he's reaping the righteous. That's who he's reaping here is the righteous. Cast in his, thrust in his sickle, begin to reap the earth, and who he is reaping is the wheat. That's what he's gathering here. And it speaks of them here that these, the wheat or those that follow the Lord, have the seal of God. And he cried to, with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servant of our God on their 
foreheads. So it says here, uh, you know, don't reap it, don't do, leave it alone until we have sealed the servants of our God on their forehead. Now, dear friends, this is to take place before Jesus comes. The sealing here of God's people does not take place after he comes. This takes place before he comes. This is what is supposed to be going on now. This is what is supposed to be going on now. God is supposed to be sealing his people. Do you know what it means by sealing? Do you know what that's talking about? That is a settling into the truth. That's what the sealing is, the settling in into the truth. That means that I pick up the Word of God and I read it and I understand what it's saying and I settle into that and say, this is what I believe, this is what I believe, this is what the Word of God teaches. And I settle into that and by settling in that, I mean I don't permit anything to change me. I run on to people that they, they talk to me and they give all kinds of excuses for not doing what the Scripture says. You know, no. I have to settle into the truth and I don't let those things keep me from doing what the Scripture says. I'll be very honest with you. I've been in a lot of times and cases where I did not like the circumstances. I didn't like the circumstances, what was happening at all. But I still had to stand for what the Word of God says. And so I have to settle into the truth. And the, this is what he means by sealing the servants of our God in their foreheads. That means that in my belief, I am solid. I don't deviate from that. Okay? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. Have the faith of Jesus. I settle into the truth. I say, this is what it says. This is what I believe. And I follow it by faith. That's how I follow it, by faith. Even though the way may not be clear, I still follow by faith. I walk with him in faith, knowing that he is more than capable of taking care of me. Now, folks, what I'm talking to you about is what needs to be going on in your life today. Because you need to be preparing for the coming of Jesus. And this is what needs to be going on in your life right now, today. Not some other time, but now we need to be doing this. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. You see, gave us the Sabbath to be a sign, a sign, if you please, of this very thing. It's a sign that you and I have committed our life to God regardless of what the world has to say. The world goes a different direction altogether. I cannot go by what the world is saying. I have to go by what the Word of God says. And therefore, the Sabbath is a sign that He is able to sanctify us. Now, when it says He's able to sanctify us, folks, that means that He's able to you know what that means? He's able to change you and me. That's what it means. He's able to change us. 
to make us into what he wants us to be. And the Sabbath is a sign of this because he said, I took a day and I made a day holy so I can also make you holy. The Sabbath is the seal of God. It's a protection. You see, as long as the Sabbath's there, folks, and kept, it is a protection, it's a burial against humanism, against evolution. It's a barrier against pride and arrogance of man. It's a barrier against all those things because I have to accept that by faith. That's how I have to accept it, is by faith. That God is more than capable of taking care of me. That he, if you please, can put food on my table. Okay. Clothes on my back. That he is capable of doing this. It does one other thing, too. Every Sabbath that rolls around, it is a constant reminder to you and to me that God is the one who makes something holy, that he's the one who changes things, that God, it is a work of God. It is not the work of man. This is what he does for each one of us. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, you can't have, well, I shouldn't say you can't, but you shouldn't. You shouldn't have a harvest until the fruit is ripe. See? And so, Christ is patiently waiting on the fruit to get ripe. That's what he's waiting on. And so, it says, it's here. It says here, many shall, Daniel 12, folks, many shall be purified and made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, it says that the righteous are going to be purified, made white, refined. I don't know how to say this and get across to you how absolutely important it is. Now is the time when this should be going on. Because if you do not do it now, then you're going to do it under very severe circumstances. All you have to do is just continue on and not be concerned. And dear friend, we'll have to face it under very severe times. Listen to this. I will bring one-third through the what? Through the fire will refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. If you and I do not day by day learn to surrender our lives to the work of the Holy Spirit and let Him do His work in our lives, then we're going to be refined, but it'll be by fire. It won't be a very pleasant experience at all. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and, we, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. You see, he's just simply waiting for his people. He's waiting for his people to come to the place that their lives are changed and made different and they become like him. Then he can come back and he can reap it. But if we don't do it now, 
then as we looked at the last session or two, those are going to be very, very, very hard times. That's the reason the Lord says, blessed are those that die in the Lord, because it's going to be a rough period of time, and these characters of ours will be changed. Okay. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, good gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. But now these fruits of the Spirit, before they can be reaped, they have to be what? They've got to be ripe. So therefore, you and I must let the Holy Spirit come into our lives and do its work in our lives that we will bear the fruits of the Spirit. In other words, have to learn to be loving, to be kind, long-suffering, peace. You cannot let the old carnal nature run rampant. You have to, day by day, surrender it to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask His Holy Spirit to come into your life and change your life and make it different. It bothers me when I hear churches praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that bothers me. The Bible is very, very clear on that subject, folks. God has given us the Spirit already. That's been given. That was given at the day of Pentecost. That's why Peter said that Repent and be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul said, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? That was given to the church. And I find that people putting that off, praying that something's going to happen there, that's already been given. What has to happen is you and I need to surrender our lives so the Holy Spirit can come in and work in our lives. And He will do His work in us and will change us and make us different. He wants in every way to do that for you and for me. But if I'm over here praying for something that's already happened, you're not getting anywhere. I need to keep my life in His hands and let the Holy Spirit change me and make me different. If you're getting up Henri, out of sorts, on the wrong side of the bed, then get back in bed and get out on the other side. But don't, don't continue to let that run rapping in your life. If you're unkind, then, dear friends, surrender your life to the Lord and let Him handle the circumstances and be kind. Squelch your pride. If you have a hard time going to somebody and saying, listen, I'm sorry, forgive me for what I did, then squelch that pride and go. You've got to let the Holy Spirit work and do its work in your life and my life to prepare us for the coming of Christ because when He comes, He's going to reap His harvest now. And I can tell you right now, character is not developed after Christ comes. Character is developed now. And those fruits of, those spirit, of the Spirit must be working in our lives. If He does that, what will happen? But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed transformed into the same image from glory to glory 
just as by the Spirit of the Lord. You see, this transformation of our characters does not take place by trying. It doesn't take place by willpower. That will never work. The transformation of character takes place by beholding Christ, by spending time with Him. Let me tell you a little secret. If you spend time thinking about all your sins, you're going to do it more. Don't spend time on all your sins. Spend your time looking at Christ, dwelling upon Him, spending time with Him. And as you behold the Lord, this transformation will begin to take place and your life will be changed. It will be made different as you behold Jesus. If you're not very kind, if you're not very loving, spend time with Jesus. He'll change that. He'll make you that way. But you've got to spend time with Him. And this is the way the character is formed and developed so that when Christ comes, it will be ripe and He will be able to reap the harvest. Okay. Now, then another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Interesting. Who had the sickle and who thrust it in and reaped it to begin with? Christ. See, Christ is the one who reaps the righteous. Christ is the one who reaps the righteous. Now, this starts the reaping of the wicked, the lost. That's what this angel is about to do. And another angel came from the altar who had power over fire, cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of the vine of the earth, for the grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. So it says that this was the reaping of the wicked took place. Now there's a number of things here. To begin with, the wicked have made their decision. They have decided that they're going to follow the beast, the false prophet, the dragon. Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of the vine of the earth and her, and her grapes are fully ripe. Uh, the cup of iniquity is completely full. There's no reason for time to go on any longer. God has been patient for 6,000 years. He's waited, and now he's ready to thrust in his sickle. When he does this, these four angels, four angels that God has, that he has given commission to hold back, hold back the winds of strife. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. These angels are patiently holding back the winds of strife. They've been holding them for a long, long time. And far as I'm concerned, I believe a little bit of those winds are beginning to seep through. And you and I are beginning to see some of these winds of strife that are going to happen. But the day's going to come 
when he's going to tell them, let them loose. And when God lets those loose, terrible will be the results. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Here, the wrath of God is contained in these seven plagues or seven bowls. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. The wrath of God is going to be poured out upon this earth like mankind has never seen. You know, we talk about weapons of warfare. We don't have any idea. We don't have the slightest concept of what the weapons of God are. I mean, we talk about the force of an atom bomb. It's nothing compared to the forces that God has. And when he unleashes them in the seven last plagues, mankind will have never seen anything like it or ever will see anything like it again. For in it, the wrath of God is complete. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. So you have two angels here. You have one angel that has a sickle, and you have another angel that has power over fire. Those are the two that have come to reap the earth of the harvest of the tares. That's what those two are doing. That's why it says the angels are the reapers. They come to reap it. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. So what's going to happen? It's going to reap it, so it will be at the end of this age. The winepress trampled outside the city. And blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridles for about 1,600 furlongs. Now let me explain. This is projecting right down at the very end of the destruction of the wicked. When there, it speaks of the wicked coming up and surrounding the city. They went up on the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city. Here all the wicked are that have ever lived since the beginning of mankind. There they are, and they have come up, and they have surrounded the city of God. The Bible says that the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. And when that thousand years is finished, all the wicked are resurrected from their grave, and the devil will marshal them, and they'll go up, and they will surround the city of God. This is what this is talking about. And then it says, And fire came down from God out of heaven, and what? Devoured them. One of those angels has the power of what? Fire. So he comes. This is the very end when they will be thrown into the fire. The tares will be and burned up. They will be no more. This is what happens, takes place. I want you to read a statement from a book entitled Great Controversy that speaks of this very period of time. And this is what it says. The wicked are filled with the same hatred of God that inspires Satan. But they see that their case is what? Hopeless. That they cannot prevail against Jehovah. Their rage is kindled against who? Satan. And those who have been his agents in deception. 
and with fury of demons they turn upon them. Here these people, the devil and his agents, who have deceived the people, who told them they didn't need to do this, as they're there faced at that city, and they see all this, and they understand that their case is lost, that it's hopeless, they turn their wrath and their anger upon the devil and his agents. And the Bible describes exactly what happens to them. Because this is what it tells us. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and the garments rolled in what? Blood. But they shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Talks there, there. But it's going to be with blood and that blood is fuel for fire. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and his fury upon the armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Terrible will be that. I mean, folks, here is all the wicked that have ever lived outside that city. So you're not talking about one or two people. You're talking about billions that are gathered outside that city. And there are thousands, millions, and millions of people who have been agents of the devil to deceive the people. And when the people turn upon them, terrible will be the slaughter that takes place. It talks about the blood coming up as high as the bridles of horses. It will run for, for 184 miles. That's what it says. Terrible will be the slaughter that takes place there. Upon the wicked, he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. These shall be the portion of their cup. This is what will happen at the end when the whole thing comes to an end and it's reaped. God in his mercy puts an end to all of it. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. This O earth will be burned. All the wicked will be as snare, be as wicked weeds, they will be burned up. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for what? New heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. It's going to come back, going to put an end to all the sin, and never again throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity will there be such a thing as sin anymore. There will be no more heartache. There will be no more sorrow. All that will be gone, and the righteous will reign with him supremely throughout eternity. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the promise that you're coming back. May each one of us here, may it give our allegiance to you. May we follow you and walk with you in all that we do. May we be settled into the truth of your word. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're coming down to the very end of this session. And to this evening, our subject is the seven last plagues. We're going to take a look at these plagues that these angels turn loose and what happens on the earth. So we hope you can be here for that and that you'll continue to follow God's Word. God bless you. Thank you for being here.